Today, I sit down with author Eric Barker, whose new book plays well with others, the surprising science behind why everything you know about relationships is mostly wrong. This was a fascinating read. We talk about some of the big themes that Eric covers in the book, such as the importance of friendships, how we can develop them, especially in this seemingly connected but disconnected world, how to strengthen our relationships, such as our marriage, and the importance of community and how we can start feeling more connected with our community and actually building it. So if you want to tackle some of life's big questions, then you will love this conversation with Eric Barker. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Eric, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. Thank you. One thing I love doing is I, I love decoding and deconstructing like the person behind the story. So I would love to know for you, you've put out consistently high quality work for a very long time now. And I'm wondering for you, has there been anything really important or foundational for you that you've done consistently over time that allows you to put out that great work? I mean, really, really focusing on quality. I mean, I think there's, it's, it's just kind of saying like, what is good research? What is actionable? What is entertaining? You know, I, I never want to bore people. I never want to give them that's useless or self-indulgent. I guess I've always just kind of focused, you know, sometimes to my detriment on, on just trying to, trying to do high quality work. How did you initially set the bar on what high quality was? Is this something that evolved over time or did you have a great model early on you were working off of? Uh, absolutely. It has evolved over time. Uh, again, probably to my detriment. Uh, I mean, I, I started out just on my blog 13 years ago, just posting like interesting abstracts from studies. Then I started pulling multiple studies together. Then I started looking at, you know, books and started breaking those down and I've tried to continually raise the bar, but it's definitely made doing a post used to be, uh, you know, a lot of cutting and pasting, you know, and now it's, it's, it's a much, it's a much bigger effort. And so it's, it's something where I, I enjoy it. I enjoy kind of trying to, to take it to the next level, but it, it's definitely a lot. What's it, what's the internal tension like for you as you try to raise that bar? I mean, it's, you know, often it's just an issue of time. It's an issue of how long is this going to take me to, to do it right and to do it well and constantly kind of tweaking the process to find something that's efficient while still as effective or more effective. Interesting. Uh, I'm wondering, has, has there been anything else for you? I'm even thinking about just like a general mindset that's been really important for you over time that you think has just helped you out along this journey? I mean, basically that ev everything I do needs to be needs to be informative and entertaining. You know, if, if it's neither, you're in really bad shape. If it's one, I guess that's okay. But for me, I always try and balance the two where it's something that's useful and actionable, interesting. But on the other hand, it's something that has entertainment value that's accessible, useful, relatable to the reader. And I think those two can be effectively balanced, but it, it also... It also takes a lot more time to weave those two together in an organic way. Thinking about that weaving process, do you, do you have an interesting creative process or do you just kind of boom, sitting down to write pretty consistently or, or is there actually some creative element to the actual creative process? I mean, for, for me, first, it's finding the subject, finding the topic, finding the resource, and then it's, you know, okay, what can I pull from here? How can I work from that? How can I extract the, the value from that? And then it's kind of like structure. What's the most effective form of presentation to get it across, you know, in a very clear, useful way. And then the entertainment value issue that feeds into the structure, but it's more of an issue of, of presentation and delivery. I'm always intrigued how people's work changes them and influences them. So I'm wondering uh, how you were changed by your book. So the first one, Barking Up the Wrong Tree, and then your most recent one, Play Well With Others. Do, do you think you fundamentally changed as a person through the process of writing those? Definitely. I mean, looking at like psychology, you know, personal development, self-help stuff, 
it, it, you know, in some ways it's punishing because you're constantly looking around going, I'm doing everything wrong. You know, it's that's inevitable if you're looking at enough stuff. On the other hand, you can start to, you know, improve things. You can start changing things. I don't think I've changed my fundamental personality very much for the fundamental way I do things, but it does give you the ability to step back a little bit and question how you're doing things, tweak it at the margins or turn your natural propensities, you know, in a better direction to hopefully, you know, channel or maybe sublimate those into a way that is, you know, more productive, perhaps less neurotic. And, uh, you know, so for me, definitely this has been an evolution and, you know, specifically since I'm working in the personal development space, I'm learning, you know, processes, tips, tricks, ideas of how to, you know, not only work better, but hopefully to live better. I mean, that's the goal for my readers and I can't help but absorb a fair amount of that. And, but it's challenging to, to always, to really implement that into your life. So I'm cognizant of that for myself. And I try and, I try and really think about that when I'm writing something because I know it's going to be even more of a challenge for my readers because they're, they have less time to devote to it. Maybe that's the reason your work connects so deeply with me. That's the filter I think through everything, right? Like how is this going to help me live better? And your new yeah. book play, play well with others. It hits on like some really foundational principles. And so like just some of those ones that I think about a lot um, and that you touched on and did a beautiful job touching on is our relationships, both friendships, but then also marriage uh, for me, significant others for other people. Uh, that's really important. The impact of community, deeper connection, love, things like that. Um, so I, I love the, the science, the research you bring to these, these topics that, that are instrumental in how we're going to live. And speaking of that, I, I'm going to read a line from your book uh, because I want to talk about something that, that you bring up here. And it's, we'll see that the fundamental core of relationships is the story our brains weave to create identity, agency, and community, and how those stories not only bind us together, but can tear us apart if we're not careful. Relationships bring us the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. We all fear being vulnerable or embarrassed. And then you go on and you say, whether you're already good with people or you're a socially anxious introvert, we can all build better friendships, find love, reignite love, and get closer to the others in this age of increasing emotional distance and loneliness. I, I feel like this is going to encapsulate a ton of the conversation, but I what, what I really want to hit on is the stories we tell ourselves. And can you just talk about the impact that the stories we tell ourselves have on our own lives? It's the theme that runs through like all of the aspects of relationships that I dealt with, you know, we tell ourselves a story about ourselves that actually is our self. Um, we tell ourselves a story about others. You know, we, we often, I talk a lot in the book about first impressions and how, you know, 70% of the time, roughly, you know, we're pretty good at sizing people up quickly, but you know, in school, 70% is a D. So, you know, we, we get it wrong a lot too. And those first impressions are sticky. You know, and then the story we tell ourselves about all of our personal relationships in terms of friendships and especially in terms of love, you know, John Gottman, the leading expert uh, on love, you know, his claim to fame is being able to talk to people and within a few minutes be able to predict with 90 plus percent accuracy whether they're, they'll be divorced in five years. And he does that really, literally by asking them, to tell their story about their relationship. And that, that is the thing that, that really tells him how it's going to go. And then communities are always bound up in stories, whether it's, you know, religions, nations, you know, these are stories we tell ourselves about what binds us together. And often, you know, it, there's an us versus them factor where our story versus their story that can, can be the flip side, the dark side uh, of those stories. So we, we don't often think about it. We think it's, it might be facts or emotions, and those are all relevant. But in the end, you know, our brain is a story producing machine. And that's kind of what undergirds, you know, all of our relationships in our lives. You mentioned Gottman's work around marriages and the stories we, we tell about our marriage. I'm wondering if you can add just some, some deeper context here into what a, a great story would look like that would help and be beneficial to our lives versus uh, a negative story that could really damage our life. Yeah. For, for Gottman, the thing he looks for in the story of a, a romantic couple uh, is, is basically celebrating the challenges, you know, mm -hmm. is when 
you face difficulties, is that something where, hey, we had some tough times, we got through it, we're stronger because of it. That's a very, very positive sign to him that this couple is in good shape, that it's going to last versus we dealt with challenges we're still dealing with. It's difficult. I'm you know, not thrilled with everything, but fine, whatever. You know, that's not that doesn't bode well. You know, having that idea that, yeah, it's like there's going to be challenges. We're going to deal with them. We're going to deal with them together. And and that's going to be part of the story that we're not writing propaganda. Hey, there's tough times, but you know what? We talked, we learned things about each other and we're improving that kind of, you know, up and to the right, uh, you know, element to it. If you were to graph it, you know, that's what he's looking for. And I think that's critical in all our relationships, being realistic that there's going to be difficulties, but also realizing that if handled properly, those can in the big picture be a positive. Did you come across anything in your research around people who didn't tell great stories of themselves in their own lives and their ability to then tell better stories moving forward? I'm just wondering how easy this change is for people. I mean, you know, specific to it, like Robert Sternberg, who's another leading researcher on love, like actually wrote a book, you know, a, a, about it called, you know, Love is a Story. Like, I mean, you know, this is this is how how essential it is. And on the personal level, you know, we, we deal with these things as well. It's that, you know, when you look at uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, basically the most effective form of, of therapy we have right now, basically is taking the beliefs and ideas that someone has about themselves and their lives and rationally challenging them. You know, this helps people in terms of depression, anxiety, that basically what it's doing is taking that person's story you know, and rationally challenging it. Like, no, your life's not that bad. No, that terrible thing is not likely to happen. Taking that story, which again, it's not necessarily fact-based, it's not necessarily rational, and having it be rationally challenged in order for that person to go, yeah, wait a second, like the, the story I'm telling myself about who I am, my capacities, my abilities, the life I'm living, like this isn't rational, this isn't making sense. You know, and that's why I'm unhappy. It's that story that they're telling that is making them unhappy or making them anxious and aligning that story more with reality, you know, typically helps people feel much better. So that story is critical, not only in relationships, but again, on a, on a, on a personal level. Yeah. Speaking of, of those relationships, you brought up a stat that just blew my mind. And this is around friendships. And it's something along the lines of friends bring us the most amount of happiness. Overall friendships, I think the the amount that they account for for happiness is 58%. Is that really true? Friendships account for 58% of the happiness in our lives? I mean, a big part of, you know, a big part of happiness is, you know, it's at the genetic level is, you know, some people have a you know, and are born with a high bar. Some people are born with a lower bar. Where do you but, fall? <laughs> uh, <laughs> not sure. Maybe on the lower end, actually. But, you know, but relationships have, you know, tremendous, have a tremendous effect on it. I mean, the happy, having good relationships overall, one economic study found that it was the equivalent of an extra $131,000 a year. But friendships hold a very special place in the sense that, you know, friendships are the most happiness inducing relationship we have more so than family, more so than spouses. And I found this fascinating because the, the issue is that most of the other relationships in our lives have an institution backing them. You know, your employer, you have a contract there, your marriage contract, you know, your kids, you, you, all of these relationships have a kind of metaphorical lobbying group behind them an institution, uh, so you have obligations. Um, obviously, obligations are often necessary, but they're also obligations. It's stuff you have to do. Friendships are the one exception here, where if you don't really like somebody and you're not enjoying their company or they're a bad person, you can stop seeing them. There is no obligation, there's no contract. So what you find with friendship is they're very fragile you know, in over the course of seven years, 50% of close friends are no longer close friends anymore. You know, we friendship's fragile, but the fragility of friendship proves its purity mm -hmm. in the sense that you can leave at any time. You know, it's like there's, there's, you know, this is not a, this is not a, a long-term lease 
Uh, you know, you have, you, because of that, the only reason you're with this person is because they're good to you. You enjoy their company. So it's almost like a filtering mechanism. And that's why friends make us happier than any other relationship, because it's, it's always a choice, never an obligation. So if you're there, you know, they make you happy. So most friendships then not lasting seven years, what about the ones that do? What about the ones that sustain it for 70 years? Like what constitutes quality in friendship? This was really interesting because I think the, probably the source that most people are familiar with when it comes to friendship is uh, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And so that was the first thing I looked at. And Dale Carnegie's book was written before the advent of most social science research. So, you know, it's, it's largely anecdotal. But the funny thing is the majority of what Carnegie had to say holds up. Like a lot of those principles are very effective. The only thing he was wrong about was he, he said to, to see things from the other person's perspective. And when you look at the research, we're actually terrible at that. Um, but overall, he was right. The only thing about Carnegie's book is that it's basically about the beginning of friendships. Hmm. It's about meeting people and it's about influencing them. It's not about creating these deep, solid, you know, brother from another mother type friendships, you know, for that, you have to go past just what Carnegie had to say. And what I found in the research is that it's, it's the two things that are really critical for those deep, long lasting friendships are time and vulnerability. Time is the thing that friends are most likely to argue over. And time is a powerful signal. You only have 24 hours in a day. If you consistently spend time with someone, that's a signal that they're important to you. By the same token, vulnerability, opening up, saying things that might make you look bad, that's a powerful signal of trust and safety that you would tell someone something that they could potentially use against you that might make you look stupid. And the most powerful way to create trust in others is to first trust them. So by opening up to people, we really give a very powerful, robust signal that we trust them, we feel safe with them. And if there's somebody who is a friend, has been a friend, they're very likely to reciprocate. These are the things that, that deepen those relationships and help friendships to last over time. So if you're going to a networking event, reread Dale Carnegie's book, if you want to develop deep lasting relationships, really think about time and vulnerability here. I was thinking a lot about time. Uh, so within the last three weeks here, I got together uh, with some of my best friends from growing up. Uh, so we hadn't all been together. And I think it was last in five years with COVID and everything like that. So I'm wondering today, right? Like, mid thirties, kids, spouse, things like that. We've got a lot going on. What are the time commitments and what do those look like to these relationships that actually do do really well over time? I mean, well, what the research shows is uh, Notre Dame did a study of over 8 million phone calls. And what they found is that the relationships that persisted over, over the longest time were when people touch base every two weeks. Mm -hmm. That might sound a little ambitious, but Again, it doesn't have to necessarily be a phone call. It's just an insight that some level of consistency is helpful. Now, a lot of people push back on this and they'll say, oh, I have a friend I don't talk to forever. And when we get together, you know, we're, it's just like old times. Well, that's very true. You know, it's like that's, that absolutely happens. But those people usually aren't thinking about the other five friends who yeah. dropped off the face of the earth. You know, it's like you're, you're that's survivorship bias. You're yeah. only looking at the ones that lasted. You know, it's like so, you know, touching base, you know, preferably every two weeks. And what's generally good, what I found and is that basically making it into a ritual, making it into something that fits into your life, scheduling something on Outlook is kind of cold and mechanical and that's not going to happen versus, hey, you know, we, 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 go, we, we go to the gym together, we play tennis together, we get coffee every Sunday, you know, we, hey, if they're far away, you know, we, we play Call of Duty on Xbox together. You know, it's like having something that's kind of organic that you do together, that's kind of consistent, you know, that really helps friendships last. What about the impact of technology? Like my friends were spread throughout the country and things like that. So I'm wondering, is there a difference between jumping on a Zoom call, a phone call versus if I'm actually going to sit down and get coffee with one of them? I mean, there's no doubt like face, face to face is better, but you know, if you're far away, it's like there's only so much you can do. The, the thing you want to do is to make sure that, hey, you, it's actually some quality time that, you know, you're opening up, you're sharing with one another, you know, passing texts back and forth. 
you know, that's going to be a little bit lower quality, but it's like, you know, Zoom calls, whatever. It's like, these are, are definite things. It's, it's really about that qualitative aspect where are you talking about what's going on in your life? Are you sharing your feelings? Are you doing things, you know, to get that move forward? Because opening up is really critical. I, I was shocked because I'm, I'm not the most typically vulnerable guy in the world. And to see the results, we've all been in those conversations when we're first starting to get to know somebody where it's just small talk and it just starts to go in circles and it never gets any deeper. And that's the issue is sharing something about yourself and your life. And like I said, if something is vulnerable, that really takes things to the next level. And also when you're making a new friend, it's a good litmus test. If the person doesn't respond well, okay, maybe they don't feel that close to me. Maybe this isn't going to go to the next level. If they acknowledge it, understand it, reveal something about themselves, this is a good sign that maybe this is somebody that you're you're going to have a closer friendship with in the future. When you're first for testing the waters there in terms of vulnerability, like throwing something out there, is there anything like early on that we could say that, that we could do that kind of opens up that, that vulnerability to see if they're going to reciprocate it? I mean, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an individual and personal thing, but I, I would basically look at where you're at and basically say, you know, calibrate to, to that level where maybe if it's somebody you're first meeting, Hey, I'm having this, you know, this difficult project at work that I'm struggling with. You know, that's not too harsh. You don't need to say I'm having serious problems with my kids or my wife's moving out. You know, maybe you want to save that for a little later. You know, but having that issue of what's something that's comfortable and, you know, for instance, like in the work environment, that's tricky because perceptions of competency are critical. You don't want to look like a bumbling idiot. So you might want to talk about something that is outside of work skills, something, you know, I am I'm taking tennis lessons and I'm just doing terrible, <laughs> you know, where you are opening up, you are sharing your feelings, you are talking about weaknesses or struggles. But it's not something that's going to be perceived as a threat to your competency in the office. So you want to think about that and be incremental about it. Start with something small, see if the person acknowledges it, understands, reciprocates, and then, you know, push it a little further, escalate it. This is this is from uh, research by Daniel Hrushka, where it's really powerful to share something, see if they acknowledge it, reciprocate and then escalate. This is how friendships deepen. This is how people get to know you. A lot of people will be critical of their friends or friendships and say, you know, I don't feel supported. I don't feel they're there for me. Well, if you're not sharing the problems you're dealing with, it's kind of hard for people to help you. So, you know, that's that's really kind of the first step in getting more support from your friends. Yeah, I really like how you shaped that in the workforce. I was recently talking with a CEO. He, he he manages or his company has about 100 employees. And he was saying one of the foundational things he's done over the last year is open up his vulnerability. But like you said, he opened up being vulnerable in things that were outside of work. And what he said is that expanded the other people within his company. They started being more, more vulnerable. So obviously that built trust and just the group felt more cohesive. But he started small steps with vulnerability that was outside of work. So it didn't degrade his competence so that they, they still viewed that that leader dynamic. I just think that's that's really important. I liked hearing about that. Thinking about friendships and technology, I'm really, really fascinated about what you uncovered around loneliness and so is it true loneliness, the, the way we view loneliness now, wasn't really a concept until the 19th century? Yeah, this is work by Fay Alberti at University of York. Basically, she says loneliness pretty much didn't exist before the 19th century, you know, as an experience. And that sounds insane. And that was my reaction when I first read it. But as she, you know, unveils it, she's a historian. Uh, it starts to make a lot more sense. You know, before the 19th century, we were all embedded in religions, nations, tribes, groups. We had a communal story. We had something that connected us to other people. You know, so this story lasted as opposed to in the modern world, we have a much, much more individualistic, atomized vision of things. We, we don't have these stronger more fundamental, you know, almost tribal associations with groups. And it aligns with a lot of the research. John Cacioppo the, was the leading researcher on loneliness. And what he found was that non-lonely non people and lonely people spend about the same amount of time with others, which again, 
Sounds ridiculous. But what Cacioppo found is that loneliness isn't about proximity to other people. Loneliness is how you feel about your relationships. You know, you can go on a business trip and not feel horribly lonely because you know that your family's still there. You know, you have friends that care about you. But if you were in a, in a time of your life where you were questioning all those things, it would be really hard. It's about your perception of the quality of your relationships because you can be in the middle of Times Square on New Year's Eve surrounded by other people. We've all felt lonely in a crowd. Simply being nearby others doesn't mean we feel connected to them. And the research on loneliness is staggering. I mean, the, the, this, the, the elevation of stress hormones that you feel when you're lonely is the equivalent of a physical assault. Loneliness is like getting punched in the face. And it's correlated with so many negative health metrics. I, I was writing this during pandemic lockdown. It scared the hell out of me. I wasn't, I, you know, I'm, not, I'm not around other people. And here I am reading all this heart about the horrors of loneliness. You know, when we feel lonely, neuroscientists have found that your brain scans for threats twice as fast, which makes evolutionary sense. If you don't feel connected to others and danger comes, you better be, you know, looking over your shoulder because help's not coming. That's not conducive to happiness. Yeah. So it's like loneliness is really about that feeling of connection. Again, as you and I were talking about earlier, that story of connection. And so that's critical. And it's something that's often lacking in the modern world. Yeah, you mentioned what's lacking in the modern world. This is where I get really concerned and scared, especially having young kids and thinking about, I think it was a study maybe out of Japan where the younger people there are actually less interested in a relationship because it's uncomfortable, right? Like putting yourself out there and it's much easier just to sit back and flick on Instagram and go on and watch Netflix for the evening. And I'm just wondering, what's, what's your take on all this, right? Like how do we start course correcting that? It's a big issue is that, you know, across a lot of these things, our, our brains are very efficient, which is a, a euphemistic way of saying lazy. Yeah. You know, we're always trying to find the most efficient way to do things. And before, and historically, if you wanted social connection, first of all, you were probably surrounded by people, but if you wanted social connection, you had to get up and go get it. Now we can get some of the benefits from social media. We get some of the benefits, parasocial relationships from watching Netflix. And hey, so if I can get 60% of the benefits without the downside, like Netflix never asks me to borrow money. You know, it's like Instagram, Instagram doesn't, you know, Instagram doesn't ask me to help them move on the weekend. You know, like I can just stop replying whenever I want. You know, it's very tempting to have these relate these pseudo kind of relationships where I can get the benefits and not pay the costs. I can have the rights without the responsibilities. And increasingly, like I said, the Japan example I used in the book was that Romantic relationships were too much work, that it was too much grief. And this is the difficult part, is that we need to think about those more fundamental experiences, face-to-face, -face, a story of connection, where we take on these obligations, and, and we're happy to take on these obligations because we feel a part of something. You know, the best example is parenting, where even if your kids are fed and safe and clothed, as a parent, you still want to provide for them. That's work, that's effort. Why would I wanna do that? Because you love them and you care about them. So even if they're safe, you, you still wanna provide for them. That gives you a warm, positive feeling. That's true in general of communities, but we've, we've kind of lost that because a lot of things are just so easy to, to get a little bit and not have to do the work. And this is, this is a major problem in society right now. Yeah, well, I guess we're like one, one of my major concerns too is I, I assume things are only going to get easier, right? Like with the advancements of technology. So then, how do the tides get turned where this motivation actually kicks up, right? Like at the end of this, it doesn't this come down to motivation? Is I actually am motivated to live a more deep, full, deeper, meaningful life? So I'll go after a relationship, even though it'll be challenging. And yeah. I'm just wondering how you think about the motivation here. How does this motivation get increased? I mean, I don't know if it starts so much with the, the motivation as it does with missing those benefits, missing those associations. I think when we get exposure to positive communities, we do want that fundamentally. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at uh, like some of Sebastian Younger's work on soldiers, 
where like these guys actually miss the war, which sounds insane. This was something bullets are whizzing by their life was in danger, but they never in our modern society, you can't replicate that closeness, that brotherhood that they felt where they were putting other people's lives ahead of theirs and other people were looking out for them. That closeness is hard to replicate out of a, a, a war environment. So for us to just think, what are those aspects of, of our lives that are that fulfilling, where we do get that rewarding and saying, you know what? I will see a return from this. It's worth me spending more time with my family. It's worth me getting that group together. We, we, we used to get together, you know, maybe a bunch of the guys, a bunch of the girls, whatever it is. And that felt so rewarding, but we got busy. We forgot that. It's actually worth investing the energy to build that. Because what the research shows, one study from 2020 showed that if you have five friends, that's awesome. You know, you'll feel supported, you'll feel good. But if those five friends know each other, you see a big jump in the amount of support, how rewarding it is. Because a community is much more powerful than this kind of like in the one on one with five friends, because people can coordinate, they can work together, your friends can realize you're feeling down and throw a party, take you out, because now people can coordinate that community power is great. We just need to look at our lives because otherwise, when you're hungry, you know, you're hungry. When you're tired, you know, you're tired. But when we lack some of those social relationships, it's not as stark. You know, it's just we kind of just feel a little down. We feel that hum of anxiety to realize how good it feels when you're with friends, when you're with your family, when you're with a group and to say, you know what? I need to dedicate more time and resources to this thing because because it's powerful and I forget how rewarding it is. Yeah, I, I like how you bring up there dedicating the time and the resources. Something that's been instrumental for me is just around clarity, right? Like identifying what are those handful of things that actually matter. So I, I like simp think about simplifying and focus, simplify to those essential core things and then focus on those deeply. Um, that, that's been really helpful for me. One of the things that you bring up um, is around people who go through, we can call it catastrophic type things within yeah. their lives, their, their, their ability to bounce back. I know this doesn't hold true for marriage, and I'd like to talk about that in a okay. minute. But yeah. I, I'm just wondering what, what you uncovered about people, because we're so fearful of those challenging things, right? Like we never want to go through that. But what you yeah. end up finding in your research is people that go through these things actually end up having more enriching yeah. and meaningful lives. We, we don't we don't give ourselves enough credit for how resilient we are. We, we once we tend to get over something, we, we tend to forget about it once the emotions fade. We are generally extremely resilient. When you look, even look at, you know, people who have dealt with the most extreme things, you know, like situations of violence or situations like the vast majority do not get PTSD. The vast majority do not have that. We, we forget this. Most people in most situations are very resilient. The, the point I make in the book is kind of the flip of that is that is that divorce and extended unemployment are two areas where they seem to produce a kind of permanent dip in our happiness, a permanent dent. Um, and I point that out as the exception, because usually we are very resilient. Once the emotions die down, we tend to move on. There can be trauma, certainly for some people, but that's not by any means the default. So why is it that a divorce, an ending of marriage, can be so detrimental and so lasting? I mean, it's basically, you know, so central to our lives, especially recently. In the past few decades, this is work by Eli Finkel at Northwestern, is that, like, the correlation between life happiness and marital happiness has strengthened dramatically over the past few decades. Uh, and what you've seen is the amount of time with friends, time with extended family, and many kind of social community activities have all dropped. Basically, you know, your happiness, the happiness of your marriage is now incredibly predictive of your happiness with life because we're not as involved with communities. We don't mm -hmm. see friends as often. So we're almost kind of all in on marriage. Before, 
it, that was one facet of your life. Now it is like the relationship. And so when that craters, you know, people's whole lives can, can come apart. There was one study I cite in the book where they looked at the most stressful things that people can experience and, you know, divorce beat going to prison. You know, it was, it was number two. And like I said, in recent years, we don't have the extended community and relationships that we used to. So you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket. When that falls apart, your life can potentially fall apart. Yeah. One of, one of the things you said is you said marriage is like gambling. There's going to be like the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. So yeah. the, essentially what you were saying there, right? Like great marriages, yeah, bring that that incredible amount of happiness, but then also the downside of that. You also bring up, there's there a line you have in the book, which I think is just so important. And that's married love is a choice and one that will require diligent, consistent effort over time. Love is a verb. If you want to look good and be healthy, you have to consciously work on it. Love is no different. Uh, I just think like like smacks to the face around this are really important. Um, just seeing the number of people who think that great marriages are just supposed to happen. Like yeah. you signed up for it and yep, we're going to have this great marriage. It's consistent work over time. Um, what else did you find in your work just about the work that is required for marriage? Well, I mean, you know, this wasn't always true. You know, in, in the past, excuse me, marriage was much more societally defined. It's much more culturally defined. It was much more structured. And, you know, and divorce wasn't an option. And the community was much more involved. And so marriage could be much more kind of strangling in one sense because you didn't have a lot of options, a lot of alternatives. It was very scripted, you know, but it was very stable. Now we have a lot more freedom. We have a lot more options, which in many ways is great. However, that also means, you know, if, if, if you're on a train, you know, you can't affect how the train's going. It's going to be very stable, very consistent. If you're in a car, well, you can choose to hit the gas pedal and go 120 miles an hour. You know, great. That's a lot of freedom. You could also hit a post at 120 miles an hour. So the issue here is the modern marriage, we have an enormous amount of freedom. So that gives us a lot of ability to customize it, tailor it and make it great. It also gives us a lot of ability to screw it up if we're not much more thoughtful and deliberate about it. That control is a double-edged sword. And that's why, as I talk about in the book, you know, we, we need to be more cognizant of this, is that basically marriage has become a lot less stable and there's a lot more variance in marriage now. The bad news is marriage is not as fulfilling in many ways or as stable as it used to be in the past. The good news is if you do the work that we have right now, the happiest marriages today are the happiest marriages that have ever existed. You've got a lot more variance there, a lot more swings. So if you do the work, there's much higher upside. Uh, Eli Finkel refers to this as kind of like the winner take all model. And so in terms of what we need to do, it's really critical to do a, a number. I talk about a number of things in the book, but to specifically address one of them is you know, the, the, those insane feelings of love that we feel early on in a relationship, they tend to die down. A lot of people find that depressing, but it, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, initially love is very passive and that can be deceptive. You know, we, it just hits us. We just feel that. We can keep those feelings alive, but it has to be a little bit more proactive. We can't just rely on it to happen passively. And one of the things we can use is what's called emotional contagion. Basically, go out and have fun. We, we, we don't, they did a study of couples. They compared two cohorts. One did pleasant activities and another did exciting activities. And the couples who did exciting activities were so much more happier, so much more fulfilled. The relationships were so much better because of emotional contagion. Whatever environment we're in, we tend to associate those feelings with whoever we're with. So if you're doing boring stuff, you might end up seeing your spouse is boring. If you're doing fun, exciting stuff, you're going to appreciate that relationship that much more. This was hard during the pandemic, but now that we're coming out of it, to go out, to do more exciting things, more stimulating environments, to keep those positive feelings alive, this is something that a lot of relationships need that, that they typically don't get. Because again, we kind of get lazy, and that's not an option with, with marriage in the 21st century.
yeah, I mean, it's around responsibility, right? Like you said, marriage is up to you. It's it's yeah. do it yourself, right? And like the importance of understanding these things, but then what do you want your marriage to be? What, one of the things that blew my mind is, is what did you discover about people's brains uh, who are in love? Basically, we, we do kind of go crazy. Yeah. Um, you know, is that when you look at people who are in love, you know, if you didn't, if you went to a psychiatrist and didn't tell them that you were newly in love, you know, you could easily be di diagnosed with mania. And if you were dealing with heartbreak and you didn't mention that you had just had a breakup, you could easily be diagnosed with, uh, with major depressive disorder. And this is from Frank Tallis, who is a psychiatrist, um, that, you know, marriage does drive us a little bit crazy. But again, this is not a terrible side. This is important much like we were talking about with friendship, where time, vulnerability are powerful signals to the other person that you care about them. Being a little bit nuts is a powerful signal to the person you're in love with that you care about them, that you have gone beyond rationality. And one study, one study compared cultures and looked at the issue of ghosting, you know, and what they found was in cultures where it was easier to go out on a date, date with someone and then just vanish, the craziness of love, the signals of love were higher because again, that powerful signal, if it's easy to ghost, I'm going to need to demonstrate more that I'm really interested. I'm really invested. I really care. You know, so the craziness of love is real, you know, uh, Arthur Aaron found that basically it's a motivational system. It, we're like addicts, we're like junkies, but that's really powerful to tell us this is important. Connecting with other people is important, but it's not only important for us, it's also important for the other person that they see your level of investment, your level of interest, that you're acting a little bit nuts, shows them, wow, they, they are really taken with me. So, you know, the craziness of love can certainly cause problems. On the other hand, there's, there's a good reason why it exists. Can, can you even go further on that about like the two becoming one? I'm thinking about like self-expansion and growing yeah. together with your significant other. Yeah, this is really critical. Like self-expansion, you know, this is part of what we were talking about with the excitement issue of going out on more fun dates and stuff. But when we feel that we're growing, we're learning, we're expanding ourselves, this is powerfully tied to relationship satisfaction, you know, in marriage and, and whatever else. Another aspect that John Gottman talks about is the issue of getting to know your partner. Now, everybody says that, everybody hears about, oh, get to know your partner. No, 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 no. Just knowing how they like their coffee is not enough. You know, the, knowing their favorite TV show is not enough. Asking them the hard questions. What does marriage mean to you? What does is, what is being a good husband mean to you? What does being a good wife mean to you? What does love mean to you? There's no easy answers to these questions. And the answers are always going to be personal and idiosyncratic. But this is really critical because you're probably screwing up and you don't know it. Yeah. You know, if, you're, if your partner sees, you know, simple chores around the house as an expression of love and you see them as crap I need to get around to, that's why they're getting so upset. If, if your partner sees something as really important, you don't see it as something, or you see something as a big signal of love and caring and investment, and they don't know that, it's gonna cause problems. So to ask those questions, you're kind of getting the answers to the test. To, to really talk to them about those big things, again, that are idiosyncratic, they will vary from person to person. This needs to be discussed because there's no other way you're going to find out except from that individual. Once again, consistent theme here, actually doing the work, right? Like not just surface level with, with your significant other, like let's go a few levels deeper here. One of the things like I, I fall victim to is like expecting my spouse to basically like fulfill everything, right? Like yeah. we, they, they need to be like our, our lover, the, the ones who are taking out to everything. And it's just unrealistic. And so it's been helpful even reading some of your work about how our spouse, our significant other, we can't expect them to fulfill all of our needs. Um, I, I just think it's a really good reminder um, and is important. Well, one of the things you hit on in terms of importance is actually like the meaning of life. And I would love for you to just touch on this here. Yeah, basically I was, 
I was a little skeptical of talking about this because, you know, people have gotten burned at the stake for getting this wrong. But, um, you know, uh, Roy Baumeister at FSU did some research on this and he found what is that thing that produces a feeling of meaning in life? What is that thing that when we're exposed to it consistently, we feel our life is meaningful? And what it was, was a sense of belonging. And this research has been cited like 26,000 times, like it has been validated. A sense of belonging is what produces a feeling of meaning in life, which ties in again with the issue of loneliness being a story, being terrible for you, you know, causing you to scan for threats twice as fast. When we feel we belong, we feel we're a part of something, life is meaningful because in the end, it's our relationships that are so critical. It's, it's, it is why we do most of the things we do. It is, if you think about the highest of highs in your life, and the lowest of lows, they probably have to do with your relationships. So yeah, with, with meaning of life, it really comes down to that issue of feeling a part of something, of belonging. I love it. Tackling some of the big questions here. Eric, I'm not going to lie. Like I, I said this before, your book I thought was just fascinating to say the least, but not only fascinating, like deeply impactful because of the big topics that you do tackle. And, and one of the things I'm really curious about is just the amount of research that went into this. I mean, you, you studied a, a, probably close to a dozen studies here, just in the 45 minutes we've been talking, <laughs> what the hell is your research process like? Uh, <laughs> uh, painful. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> no, I'm blown away by it. This, I mean, I had some help in the sense of I've been doing this blog for 13 years looking at research so that but there was a lot of stuff where each chapter presented its own challenges, you know, looking at love and marriage. There's tons and tons and tons of research just reading it all getting through it all was enormous friendship was the exact opposite. There's very, very little research on friendship just finding it was was a challenge on its own, but no, believe me, if I wasn't locked down during the pandemic with nothing else to do, uh, I don't know if I would have uh, written this book quite as quite as quickly. But I, I mean, I, I had one friend who as soon as he saw the book, all, the only text he sent me all caps was you have 45 pages of citations. Yeah. And and this friend was Josh. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Josh Kaufman being the, the one who I uh, set this one up here, but I, I'm wondering all the years you, you mentioned 13 plus years doing the blog, is there a favorite piece of research you've come across? I know that's kind of throwing you on the spot. I'm just wondering if your mind goes anywhere. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's tons of things. I mean, in terms of usefulness, in terms of like fun and irony, you know, but you know, one, one, one thing recently that really was impactful, which actually I included in the book, was John Gottman's ability to listen to the first three minutes of a conversation and predict the ending with over 90% accuracy. It's something I keep in mind now, you know, because I can be pretty blunt at times. And um, just that he was able, if a conversation starts difficult, starts cut, it's going to end that way. So if you just are a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more thoughtful when you raise issues can have a tremendous impact on all your relationships, but especially love. To me, it's such a simple little thing, you know, and it's just, we don't know it, we don't do it. But when I see high leverage stuff like that, those are the things where I'm like, hey, this is great for the book, but you know what? I better write yeah. this down for myself as well. Like, those are the kind of things that where I'm like, wow, like it's not just trivia. This can make a big difference in people's lives. Yeah, John Gottman's work is one of the things that I say. So anyone who's who's in or approaching an important relationship, foundational, you, you have to go into that. Um, any other things that are just like really high leverage for you that, you, that you've come across? This does not be like research studies. Um, yeah. Any books or things like that that you've just enjoyed thoroughly over the years? I mean, so, so many, but um, you know, uh, to totally outside of it, you know, is uh, recently looking at Peter Zihan's work on geopolitics has been like mind blowing to me, you know, basically predicted the Ukraine war. And um, that's, that's been mind blowing, you know, outside of like my work. In terms of my work, you know, I am 
and I never cease to be impressed by the research on gratitude. Mm. Again, that's something that's very easy to say, oh, gratitude. But so often when we're seeking happiness, we think about what do I have to do? What do I have to accomplish? What do I have to buy? Gratitude doesn't cost a damn thing. You know, it's like to just change your perspective, to just imagine that you lost what you have, to just think about how valuable it is. We take so much for granted. And to just step back from that is, you know, this has been replicated time and time again. Gratitude is such a happiness inducer. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to do anything like substantial. You just have to reflect on your life and say, what am I taking for granted? What would happen if I lost the things I had? It's, it's so powerful to take a few minutes to do that. Can, like for me personally, it, I guess I'm very prone to taking things for granted. Um, it has very powerful effects on me, but again, looking at the research, it's one of the most powerful things you can do. And it's so simple. We just don't do it. Yeah, I just timestamped that uh, because that's a minute clip right there. I'm just going to go back and listen to it again, <laughs> again, <laughs> as, as I'm going to need a reminder, just like yourself there. Uh, it, it's clear you're, you're, you're endlessly fascinating um, or fascinated. You're curious. You're, you're continuing to learn and evolve. So if you could do this, Eric, sit down, long form conversation, interviewing anyone dead or alive, who would you love to sit down with and just kind of berate with questions? I mean, that would be a long list. Uh you know, I'm tempted on one hand to go all the way back to like Aristotle, you know, whose claim to fame is probably being the last person who knew everything about everything. And I'd love to see what he thinks about, you know, uh, the modern world. Uh, on the other hand, you know, it might be really interesting to talk to John von Neumann, who, you know, you know, was alive in the 20th century, you know, who's purportedly the most intelligent person you know, highest IQ, whoever lived is responsible for basically creating the computer as we know it, you know, talk to somebody that intelligent and see their reflections on the way the world has gone. You know, I would love to see, I guess, to, like Aristotle or von Neumann, to think about somebody who was that wise, that smart, and to see what they think of where the world is, the changes that have been, to have someone who is able to reflect on those things you know, so powerfully, that would really be rewarding for me in terms of the insights. Over 300 plus conversations, I'm almost positive no one's ever said von Neumann. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm fascinated by him as well. I, I'm just intrigued out that no one said that. Uh, but Eric, I, I truly mean, I know I've said this multiple times now, I thought your book was exceptional. Uh, yeah. I highly recommend picking it up, plays well with others, the surprising science behind why everything you know about relationships is mostly wrong. Anything else you want to leave the listeners with? Of course, we're going to have everything linked up for you. Uh, but any final words you'd love to say about the book? I mean, I learned a lot. You know, it was it was a challenge, but I it was a valuable journey for me. I've never been very good at relationships and to at the very least understand what I was doing wrong and now to be putting things in, in place to be able to make some changes. This has been I as I say at the conclusion of the book, uh, I probably needed this book more than than most people do. And so, you know, it was it was a great journey for me. Well, I can't thank you enough for writing it and joining us on the show. So, Eric, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, man.